today I wanted to present um, these are three key takeaways, these three key points. I'm going to talk about API gateways and how they've evolved over the last uh, roughly 25 years or so. And I think up until now, or give and take a few years, this evolution of the edge and API gateways has been driven by architecture and technology. As we've all moved to cloud native, in quotes, ways of working with microservices, containers, Kubernetes, I have seen the true realization of kind of the shift in workflow as well. I know we've gone from, you know, um, moved into agile from sort of waterfall and so forth, and agility got pushed into ops with the DevOps movement. But I think for me now with the technologies and the learnings we've all got, it really is the, if we all get it right, you've got the evolution of, we can own independent microservices, we can do independent releases, but it's easier said than done, to be honest. The message today is choosing your API gateway in the Kubernetes world needs to be done intentionally. And really the meta message is, if you're moving to the cloud, think about the underlying platform. I've seen a lot of folks, I've, I've been a consultant over the years and now I work for a company called Ambassador Labs. But when I was a consultant, I saw a lot of folks just lift and shift this old mindset or this old technology from the way they used to work into this new way of working. They'd read in HBR or somewhere else that, you know, the cloud was the thing to do. And they just lift and shifted their platform and their processes into the cloud. I'm sure many of you have seen that kind of thing. But my kind of meta point here today is often we have to look into the past to understand how things have evolved before we can make the right decisions for the current time and the future. Now, this talk can be as techy as, as we want, or I can try and keep it a bit high level as well. Uh, I reckon it's about 30, 35 minutes of material, roughly. 10 minutes at a slot here in, in each of the kind of TLDRs. Feel free to jump in, stop me, ask questions if you like as well. And we can do some questions at the end. Particularly the final section around the Kubernetes stuff is it's quite low level. If you're not really into Kubernetes yet, um, it might be, I might sort of have uh, gone a, a bit deep because I've done this talk at like another Kubernetes conference as well. But I think there's some core messages around the uh, early parts of the presentations of thinking about your platform and thinking about the workflows you want to encourage through the way you've built your platform, built your teams around that platform. So this is me uh, at Daniel Bryant UK on most of the interwebs, on Twitter, GitHub, et cetera, LinkedIn. Uh, I started as a Java developer pretty much, and then I did like, full stack stuff and we did ops and, and did a bit of everything, to be honest. These days I've led teams, I've been a CTO at a couple of companies. Some didn't do so well, some did okay, but I've, I've learned a, a lot over the years. And now I mainly work at uh, Ambassador Labs, doing product and, and sort of working with customers to help them adopt Kubernetes, help them adopt cloud, and we have some products in that space as well. I write for InfoQ, so you can find me on InfoQ. I actually lead the news there. So you can find me on the InfoQ podcast talking about all manner of technology. And I've written a couple of books over the years as well. And um, my latest one is Continuous Delivery in Java with my buddy Abraham Marin Perez as well. That's enough about me. So I'm going to talk about the edge. And when I talk about the edge, it's the boundary between your data center and your users. Yeah, the edge means many things to people I've, I've discovered over the years, like edge to uh, CDN vendors is kind of like points of presence, edge to a lot of the uh, IoT folks is kind of like edge devices, like mobiles and sensors. But in sort of my little cloudy world, the edge is where your users first kind of meet your backend services. And typically there's some kind of edge proxy there in the cloud or some kind of API gateway. Now, as I mentioned in the TLDR, the kind of thesis I'm rolling with today is that the evolution of the edge up until about five or so years ago was mainly driven by app architecture and the technology. So 1995, like I was actually still in high school at this point, I was still in secondary school, um, but the sort of architecture du jour was very much that monolith. Right, you know, it's very much sort of waterfall approach. You know, we know how to build this thing, let's get it all right, and then we'll just release it kind of big bang. Well. Didn't always work like that, we, we know that, but primarily it was you know, middle tier systems, database, and the client was something like a web browser. It was still, you know, we weren't really sure at the time was it it's gonna be a web browser as the way forward or something like Java applets, anyone who's worked in the Java space. And that was uh, a bit clunky, but at the time it was a sort of toss up between whether the browser or whether something like applets would actually be the way we consumed the web. At this time, we had hardware load balancers spun up. The target user was very much the sysadmins. So when we were planning out the work, you had to factor this thing in. You know, often there was a separate team. We had to make sure we coordinated as we released software, open these ports, do these things. It was very separate from the dev workflow of my experience. The main purpose with hardware load balancers was high availability and scalability. Simple sort of a load balancing at the back end, often health checks on, you know, if this instance of your app falls over or we don't route to that or route to that anymore we route somewhere else 
if we skip forward a few years, this is when I was starting to do a bit of consulting at the time. I was still studying at university. Similar architectures, a lot of Java, a lot of .NET, ASP.NET I was doing at the time, but very similar web browser, you know, back end database. But there was software edge proxies popping up. It's hard to believe that things like Nginx and HAProxy have been around 20 years. They're fantastic bits of technology, but they genuinely have been around this long. And the beauty of software load balances was they were cheaper, they were easy to kind of manipulate, they're more malleable, and um, they could be controlled sort of as part of a software development lifecycle. Now, this kind of time was pre devopsy though. So I used to experience a lot of, you know, separate teams managing the edge, even though they're coding in Nginx, we as developers were not allowed to touch the edge. We had to raise tickets, get the edge configuration done, release our app, all this kind of stuff. Similar kind of um, purpose, high availability, high scalability. Fast forward five more years again, this is the Web 2.0 generation. This was like, this is a big thing at the time, Web 2.0. I remember when I, I just left university and, and all the job adverts were in Web 2.0. So that's what I had to do, right? Uh, I did a lot of work in the e-commerce space I and mean, it was really picking off after the dot-com bust of sort of 2000, like it was coming back as a real thing now. And Ajax was all the rage. If anyone talks about Ajax, probably shows their age like me. Uh, asynchronous JavaScript and XML. This was the technology that promised not only um, the sort of the one big, you know, get ask for a web page, get a web page, ask for a web page, get a web page. It used to be very, you know, like one request, full response, full web page back. Ajax opened up the ability to make dynamic smaller requests, something we take for granted now, but you could build the web page dynamically. And this was like a, a game changer. The websites that adopted this had a richer user experience. So this is a big thing, a lot of clients I was working for. This though did change the way we interacted with the backends. We're making a lot more smaller requests now. And then the technology called the application delivery controller popped up, the ADC. And this was very much targeting at sysadmins again. And it was all about offloading a lot of the processing from web servers. So uh, TLS, transport level security termination, SSL, we used to call it back then. Um, it was all about doing caching, smart caching, because it was sort of dynamic versus static elements of websites, compression, all this good stuff. But it added another layer in the stack. So now you've got like your web server, you know, your application deployed onto that, got your load balancer, got your ADC, more and more people had to collaborate to get any software released, which did add a bit of friction in my experience with, particularly with large government projects I was working on at the, at the time. F5 led the way here, Nginx led the way in the software. Of course, now they're one and the same company. F5 have acquired Nginx, which I thought was just a little uh, funny uh, fact there. But I used to do a lot of work with, with Blades, F5, and a lot of work with them um, with Nginx as well back, back in the day. 2010, the kind of I generation, this was the proliferation of APIs. Uh, the vision at the time was, you know, we developers would get rich because we could mash up APIs and sell them. And, you know, and it was such a cool idea at the time. Right? I was thinking, oh, yeah, you know, I can, I can make some money. The reality was not quite the same, to be honest, like the, the kind of mashing up of APIs didn't quite pan out as we planned, but we, I was doing a lot of work with things like Google Maps API, Stripe for payments, um, SendGrid from emails, these kind of things. Like it was the early emergence of this API ecosystem, which we are seeing more of these days. You can, you know, don't want to reinvent the wheel yourself. You can bring in external services called via an API, bring them into your app. This, interestingly though, though the kind of API ecosystem didn't quite work out at the time, led to the release of what we're now calling API gateways. One of the classic examples is the Kong API gateway. It spun up as part of Mashape, which was a mashing up of an API uh, ecosystem vendor. They were, they were gonna offer a platform and you could choose to mash up APIs. That didn't work out as a business, but the API gateway did. Now Kong is like a really big API gateway. The interesting thing here was it was the first kind of product in this space that targeted developers as well as ops. So there was kind of the handoffs and some of the projects were interesting. How much control did we give developers and how much, you know, what, what could we do as developers? This was somewhat of a challenge. It was all about exposing business APIs to the broader ecosystem, you know, Present, presenting a kind of nice front end, like if you're familiar with design patterns, things like adapters and facades, you know, they put a consistent front end API, but the back end could be knitted together in various different ways. 
we'd moved this point from what we call L4 in the, in the OSI networking stack. So the kind of the IP and ports range, we'd moved from that into more of the L7 application level. So now we were looking into HTTP traffic and making decisions on routing based not just on IPs and ports, but we we're making decisions based on a higher level, higher level primitives. Has the person uh, logged in? What's the cookie value? What's the user agent? Are they browsing on an iPhone versus a, you know, a Windows a laptop? These kind of things. So we could do a lot in the L7 world. We could do a lot of richer decisions based on um, on that kind of metadata where we pointed them at the at the back end. 2015 time, this is when we started seeing all the fail whales at Twitter. I, I remember this kind of thing. Well, I was doing a lot of work at the time on Ruby on Rails applications. Businesses had spun up, they'd got product market fit. Ruby on Rails is a fantastic bit of technology to very quickly build applications as a monolith, but um, it can be a nightmare to debug. Dynamic languages like Ruby, it was very hard to refactor sometimes. Uh, and just in general, like it didn't scale infinitely, particularly the database component was often a challenge. Poor Twitter, you know, really, really battled. But people, we, you know, we're all innovative folks. A lot of people sort of push back and thought, hang on, if I can decompose my monolith into mini services, microservices, this is a way to scale. We'll still have the monolith doing all the routing. You know, we've got our sort of edge stack in there, our, maybe our CDN, application delivery controller, load balancer, but we'll just pull out services from the monolith and we can scale them independently. We can release them independently um, and, and that's all good. And it was. The only snag was that typically any changes you wanted to do onto the services, you had to touch the monolith as well. So I remember doing a bunch of like microservice projects at the time and we release our microservices you know, on demand, but we'd have to join a release train to get our routing configuration into the monolith, which kind of defeated the point. <laughs> so it was a very interesting time as in we're sort of learning how to decompose our applications. The second generation of API gateways helped a lot by pulling up cross-functional concerns. So a lot of things like the auth and the routing, uh, rate limiting, caching, it really pulled it out of the monolith and put it into this language neutral API gateway space. So that reduced the coupling. Now I could release my services without bugging the monolith team, which was, was great. Similar target users, sysadmins, API developers, a lot of it was about centralizing cross-cutting concerns. We had these clear layers in the edge stack, like I've sort of mentioned, CDNs, uh, sometimes web application firewalls, ADCs, et cetera. And sometimes they were controlled more by one team, smaller companies, bigger enterprises I worked at, it was multiple teams you know, involved. So again, releasing software could be painful sometimes, but there was clear responsibilities for each layer at the edge. And with the API gateway, this is where we developers kind of crowded around. We could deploy our service, we could release the service via the API gateway, and we could change the config there as well. So that's the kind of history so far. Moving now onto the cloud native kind of world, most of us are, are building microservices, you know, um, whether it's the right thing or not, like sometimes I definitely question that myself and so on some of the things I've built in the past and, and some of the things I see. It, it's really for me around modularization. You know, now we can build them on this still, nothing wrong with that. We can build microservices or we can use things like function as a service, like AWS Lambda. We've got genuinely amazing choice of technology. It's now the key thing is mapping your problem space to the appropriate technology and, of course, to your organizational design, how you actually use you know, classic kind of Conway's law stuff, as in your communication structures in the org will dictate probably how the architecture uh, actually comes out or how it works. The beauty of microservices, when, or when done correct, is that you can build, release and operate them independently and you can scale them independently. And I've worked on a couple of projects where this dream has been realized and it's been, it's been awesome. You know, we've all releasing independent cadence, we're collaborating, sure, um, but you know, we're not blocked on this one release train. Sort of it, it, an anti-pattern I've seen sometimes is the distributed monolith where we are all working on independent microservices, but we have to gate them all as a collection before we do a release of the application. So that's a, a bit of a, it can be sort of a step on the journey, but it can also be a bit of an anti-pattern. The thing now at the back end, we're spoiled for choice as engineers. We've got Kubernetes, we've got VMs still, you know, the classic world. We've got function as a service. We've got different protocols involved. I do work in this space a lot. I see a lot of gRPC, Google's RPC framework. I clearly see a lot of HTTP and REST and stuff. That's, that's all good stuff. But I also see things like um, TCP and, and WebSockets for other um, quite unique use cases, sort of more um, machine learning, financial use cases, quite raw protocols. The load balancing requirements of backend services are often different. 
working with enterprises, they've got the you know really crafty kind of money making services that you have to have sticky sessions. Like you, the web app does not work unless you hit the same back end instance all the time. If I make a request, I've got to land at the same server. Otherwise, the app kind of just you know just doesn't work in how it's how it's this, uh, how it's intended. And I've I've you know I've built a fair few of those systems in the past. Whereas the more modern systems, it's almost the opposite. We're container based. Containers come up, they get you know destroyed, they move. It's all very ephemeral. So you really need the ability as an engineer to sort of um, uh, choose what and how you map the different endpoints to the actual services. And a lot of that, my time at the moment is spent on authentication. Um, we uh, so work with enterprises and they have like many different authentication services, maybe like an Active Directory thing here, bespoke uh, single sign-on thing here. They're integrating with Keycloak, Otka, identity providers. It's just a whole host of these things like authentication sprawl, but you need to configure them through the gateway. That's where you do your sort of, you know, identity check. And, and we as developers need to say, oh, this service needs to be authed by this, you know, authentication domain, by this authentication service. Bottom line is there's a lot of things going on in this, in this gateway space at the moment. You need kind of API gateway-like functionality to mash up your backend services and expose a consistent API to, to users. You need application delivery controller-like functionality, caching, timeouts, rate, you know, rate limiting, kind of resilience features. And you need this notion of real-time service discovery. Is it a container? Is it a monolith you know, running as a uh, sort of binary? Or is it a function as a service? These kind of things. This is, you know, this is quite a lot to bake into one component and particularly sort of make it make it usable sometimes. But the key pitch really is that microservices, when done right, lead to this even bigger change. You know, you, you, the sort of true notion of agility, if you get the coupling and the cohesion right, um, it really does work very nicely in terms of the ability to evolve different parts and scale different parts of the application independently, which is great. The big notion for me with microservices done right, uh, I've seen it both in big companies and small companies, is this, you know, this of a B shape. Um, my friend's just gone funny, sorry about that. Hopefully it comes back. There we go. Can everyone hear me okay? Sorry about that. Um, yeah, this notion uh, of you build it, you run it. And it's a cliche, cliche a little bit now. Werner Vogel said this many years ago with the cloud. Um, but I, I've seen it a, a lot. You know, it's, it's the idea that you what you own you own from idea to code to testing to deploy and release in production. You know, when I was an engineer, full stack kind of meant I knew some JavaScript on the front end, some Java on the back end. These days, full stack can actually mean too much. Sometimes probably you need to know almost everything, right? And we'll cover some of that in a moment. But I do like the idea of ownership in terms of the, the you know, everyone being together, cross-functional teams. We have us having, say, KPIs, key performance indicators um, that we're iterating as a team towards. It's no longer the business and us developers. It's a real collaborative effort. But it can feel a little bit like a one-person band situation, right? You know, you're literally responsible for, for everything in these cross-functional teams. Um, it, that, that's the challenge with, with this thing. How do you appropriately control things like the API gateway as a development team? You know, you're coding, you're taking these ideas from the business, from the, your business colleagues and your team, you're coding, you're deploying, you're releasing. How do you figure out how you integrate that work with the, with the API gateway? And I've taken a lot of inspiration from, from the Netflix blog post about full cycle development. And, you know, it's, it's another kind of buzzword phrase, but I really like the premise behind it. I've seen other teams talk about it now. And for me, it's, you know, we still have this notion of platform teams, of operations teams, but their job is to curate the platform and expose it via SDKs, APIs, and other automation, not ticket driven, not the case of, you know, I raise a ticket, someone looks at the ticket, gives me feedback, I raise another ticket, and this kind of stuff. This is designed to be self-service, yeah. And the idea being is you might have teams that look at, say, build tools, deployment pipelines, metrics, insight, uh, insight tools. You know, and some of these tools, some of these um, teams may actually be almost outsourced. Like if you're deploying purely on an, the Amazon PaaS, like on Elastic Beanstalk or something, well, that might be your, your platform there. You don't necessarily need a team around it. Someone may own that sort of notion of, of, of that, um, that platform, but bigger companies tend to have these kind of teams uh, already, just, they're just a bit mashed up in, in, uh, within the ops department or within the platform department. Once you've got this kind of notion of, you know, exposing these build tools and these SDKs to like create pipelines and things like that, and, and how very clear um, interaction points with the platform, then the development teams, that's what they do. They take the, the ideas, you know, they, they, they 
um, maybe run experiments, you know, hypothesis testing, they are then responsible for the full life cycle. Designing, developing, testing, deploying, operating, and they support typically support their stuff in production too. And when I've seen this done well, it really does work nicely. You have this kind of separation of concerns. The, the dev teams are often focused on your know, business metrics, running very fast experiments, and the platform teams are doing what they do well, curating the platform, maintaining the platform, and exposing it via APIs. It doesn't work for every use case, of course. Even Netflix say they run a, a handful of their um, services, a handful of their platform, which does not conform to the full cycle development um, way of working. But I, I've still seen it um, done, and, and I still like this pattern a lot. And in fact, a couple of buddies of mine, I'm sure a few of you bumped into them, Matthew and Manuel, wrote this book, and it is a fantastic book. Only a short one. I've actually got it down here beside me. It's, it's, a, it's an easy read, and it's somewhat the codification of this idea around the full cycle development. Matthew and Manuel talk a lot about how you set up your organization is very key to the platform and, and, uh, um, and the actual life cycle, software development life cycle you can operate. And Matthew's, well, I had a chat with Matthew a few weeks ago and he was saying how you set up the, um, your teams will dictate your problem uh, solution space. If you've got a team set up in a certain way, if it's ev everyone's just together perhaps with no notion of different responsibilities, well that will limit the actual solutions you can come up with. Matthew and, and Mamo talk a lot about four different types of team. The, the, the stream aligned team is probably like a product team, a sprint team, that kind of thing, and they have a couple of other teams and they have a platform team. And they talk about how you then how the different teams interact with each other. Is it via like a team API, as they call it, which is very much like the APIs we're talking about, but in a human to human kind of um, communication form. I've learned a lot from Matthew Manuel over the years. I'm lucky enough to work with Manuel, Manuel at InfoQ. Matthew, I've known from the London and the Leeds tech scene for quite some time now. And trust me, this book, if you take one thing away from this talk, reading this book, well worth reading. Yeah, and and you'll, yeah, you'll enjoy it, I'm sure. Anyway, back to the sort of main story in that Microservices done right, this notion of platform and you know, sprint uh, stream aligned teams is a change in workflow. Developers now are more about hypothesis testing, they're more about iterating really fast, and they need these really well controlled in, it, uh, integration points with the platform, with things like the API gateway. So the thesis really updating is that the future evolution of the edge is going to be driven not only by architecture and te technology, but changes in workflow. Yeah, as, as more and more companies adopt this hypothesis-driven development, it's going to require more and more of these platform-like solutions. So this is where it's going to get a bit more sort of Kubernetes-specific, and I can skip over this one and we can ask, answer, sorry, ask and answer some questions at the end. But just to frame, two big challenges I've seen when I've worked with teams who are migrating from like a more traditional space to something like Kubernetes or, or the cloud. The first one is actually scaling the management of the edge, scaling the management of the APIs. You know, back when I was doing my Java stuff, my team and I, we owned the Java monolith. And if we wanted to tweak, say, the authentication or we wanted to tweak the rate limiting, we literally change some code, change some config, build, deploy, we're good to go. The API uh, gateway, the edge, was typically controlled by the ops or the platform team. And sometimes I needed to open up a new port or support, support a new protocol. And my team and I had to realize that sort of as part of our release workflow. We typically had SLAs, we'd raise a ticket, the ops team would look at it, give us some feedback, and we go, go around there. And this works quite well when you've got the monolith and a kind of well-established edge. Nothing wrong with this. But as you scale to microservices, there is simply more things at the edge. So you want to pull up the cross-cutting um, concerns rather than having them now baked into a language-specific uh, part, sorry, language-specific um, component like a library, because you might be having different language stacks, for example, in each microservice. Definitely manage that one carefully, <laughs> but, but we'll definitely see a lot of polyglot services, even if it's only one or two different languages. But the big thing is there's simply more services at the edge. As folks break up the monolith, you know, some of the services kind of go deep sometimes. And again, you have to be careful of that too long a call chain. There's a lot of, a lot of challenges around understanding uh, and debugging those kind of call chains if you're calling various services in a deep stack. But we definitely see a lot of folks break the monolith and split the APIs up at the edge. And with more and more APIs being exposed at the edge, you know, how do you scale that interaction? Are you constantly raising tickets with the ops team? Well, after you get to 10, 20 services, that doesn't really scale very well at all. The second challenge is supporting diverse edge requirements. Uh, you know, there's a classic kind of JSON over HTTP, REST, we all know and love REST. I'm seeing a lot of gRPC these days. Uh, a lot of companies, I mean, even some big, big kind of enterprises, more financial institutions that are more um, 
late adopters, should we say, on some of these technologies. I'm seeing them go all in on gRPC for internal communication and exposing gRPC or gRPC web at the edge. Uh, and some of them are even doing gRPC to rest like proxies at the edge, which is interesting. Um, but bottom line is there's just more things potentially at the edge now. And you might want to mix and max, match your cross-functional requirements. And how auth works with WebSockets is a bit different than how auth works with gRPC. Same with retries. A bit careful what you're retrying at the network level, transactional stuff versus non-transactional stuff. Caching, honestly, I've wasted days of my life to have bad caching issues, right? And we need to be really careful at what you cache and where you cache. So you kind of want to mix these different services, different protocols, different use cases, and these cross-cutting concerns. We as developers need to be able to configure this, yeah, because the ops team won't always have all the config, all the context. So we need to say, ah, yes, that service can be cached, that service cannot be. So the three strategies I've seen, broadly speaking, and there's a, um, a PDF you can download as well, is folks, when they move to the cloud, they do one of these three things. They either deploy an additional Kubernetes API gateway. And the classic kind of pattern here is this, is like a, a sort of entrepreneurial team within a company will spin up the Kubernetes experiment. The, you know, they'll keep the lights on with a normal stack, but they'll spin up a POC, and um, then they'll put their own gateway in that, and they'll knit it into the existing kind of system. There's the extending uh, existing API gateway pattern. I see this a lot when companies have built their own gateway. So that kind of uh, can be a bit sunk cost fallacy sometimes. You know, we've built our own gateway. We're, we're not going to plug a new one in. We're going to make sure this one is fit for purpose. We're going to extend it to support Kubernetes, these kind of things. And I also see that the third one, definitely in greenfield applications, where they're deploying the whole thing, the whole edge stack in cluster. They're deploying their WAF, their load balancer, their API gateway, like in, in the cluster, and they're deploying it through Kubernetes config. Now, there's no like, there's no one right pattern here, and um, there's definitely trade-offs for all of them. And number three, you can pretty much only do if you're greenfield because like you, you put all your stuff in Kubernetes. That's just not realistic if you're a existing uh, gate, uh, existing enterprise with a massive IT estate. That ain't happening. But there is some interesting learning points I think from looking at the three patterns, and hopefully we can draw out a few areas where. There is danger I've seen, and I've certainly made my handful of mistakes here. So if, like, if I share some of my learnings, that might hopefully influence um, some of your decisions uh, in the future. So deploying the uh, additional gateway, this is kind of like you get the an, a POC team spinning up a um, cluster to the side. So imagine we've got our kind of edge stack at the top there. The users are making requests. It's going through a WAF CDN load balancer, and it may be like a decision point made at the at an existing API gateway. If you're going to the new world traffic, you get routed to the um, Kubernetes world. If you're going to the old world, the money-making world, you get routed off to the existing infrastructure. Nice and easy, old world, new world. Can cause a bit of contention, of course, that people working on the new technology can be more exciting than working on the old technology. But that's fundamentally the pattern I see when folks are doing a POC team. The pattern on the right is where um, people are rather than spitting on an existing API gateway, they're spitting on a, a layer four load balancer. I see bigger companies do this where they use domain names, for example, subdomains, and they split their traffic, you know, old world here, new world here. But it's fundamentally the same kind of pattern. The pros is it's an, you know it's, it's minimal changes to the core edge infrastructure and incremental migration is easy because you've literally got these sort of the old world, the existing world, and the new world. The challenge is are all about the handoffs between those teams. Maintaining agility while, you know, maintaining reliability is really is really key here. I've seen a couple of gnarly challenges where we were spinning up, I was helping out the POC team, they had the Kubernetes cluster rolling, and they just couldn't get security working in the Kubernetes cluster. And it turned out it's because the security stuff was being, uh, like the headers, the data was being stripped out by the existing API gateway in the journey through to this new world. And it was a case that we hadn't collaborated enough with the existing API gateway team. We didn't know that that's how that, that gateway worked. Even though they were just forwarding the traffic onto us on our new experiment, like we didn't understand that we would lose some of the metadata surrounding the requests that we needed for authentication. And it was like, don't, you definitely need to maintain that strong collaboration between the new world and the old world. And there's all manner of like things we probably you know wouldn't and wouldn't uh, foresee that that's where that collaboration has to be there. I work with a couple of companies that are literally spinning up like Skunk Works divisions to do their Kubernetes POC, and they almost like encourage them to have zero communication with the, the existing team. And it just doesn't work. You know, you soon run into problems. 
The second pattern, this is about extending your gateway. And this is typically when you've invested in your own gateway or you've bought into a vendor's gateway and it's pretty much burrowed into your, um, your IT estate. Uh, the way folks do this is like a few vendors offer solutions in this space too. You spin up your new POC, your new Kubernetes cluster where you're doing your proof of concept um, and you deploy some components in there that syncs the applications you're releasing into that Kubernetes cluster with your existing gateway. So typically it sort of looks in the Kubernetes world and goes, oh, you've deployed a new application here and you put some annotations some metadata on, on your config and it then exposes the route to that service. Oh, you know, slash storefront now maps to this Kubernetes service. That's how you kind of join up the existing gateway to this new world. The pros of this, um, you know, same kind of thing as before, you can reuse your tried and trusted infrastructure and all the stuff you've got, you know, you invested a lot in this gateway, you don't throw any of that away. You're just building a new thing on the side. The, the key thing though, and the cons are, are somewhat similar, you need that tight collaboration with the teams. Um, it's often the case that your new world, you can annotate all the details you want. So you might wanna do a certain kind of configuration in your new proof of concept, but you actually have to chat to the API, existing API gateway team to get the config change in because the annotations you've exposed on your Kubernetes service, the metadata just doesn't give all the functionality you need. And, and I've, the biggest problem I've seen here is the single source of truth problem where we had a couple of examples of teams we're working with where the new world were deploying um, services that were overriding stuff in the existing world. There was a clash of kind of source of config and that again was just a collaboration thing. Folks working in isolation going, oh yeah, no, I'll do my proof of concept, not cognizant of what was going on in the money-making part of the organization. So that, that lack of collaboration was a, was a key problem again. And finally, this is a, you know, I'll, I won't talk too much to this one. This is the kind of the holy grail type thing, like a, in terms of a greenfield solution, you can literally spin up a, a API gateway and load balancer and WAF and so forth, all in your Kubernetes cluster. And how you configure all these things, it's literally using Kubernetes config. So I operate in this space with Ambassador, the gateway I work on, there's Contour, there's Glue, there's many new gateways in this space that are kind of newer cloud native Kubernetes specific gateways. And you know, the beauty of this is it's really simplified. All your edge configuration, all your API gateway configuration is in one place. And we as developers can configure it all with the same practices we use for deploying our services. So when we write manifests to deploy our app into the Kubernetes world, we just put on a bit of extra metadata and then that configures the firewall, it configures the, you know, the your protocols, it configures how you wanna do authentication, all this good stuff. We've got one workflow, one pipeline style to deploy our code, our config and all the edge config too. The cons though are obvious, right? It's a large architectural shift, you know, uh, and, and not only is it a large architectural shift, I've, I've worked with a few companies where engineers who've been using certain technologies for 10, 20 years have to relearn all this stuff because the technologies, the proxy technologies are often quite different in the more modern gateways. So again, it's all a trade-off. You know, we're seeing a lot of folks have a lot of success with this, but it is quite a leap into the new kind of way of configuring everything as infrastructure as code, config as code, policy as code even. So that's a whistle-stop tour there. Um, the, the kind of inclusion of what I wanted you to take is that over the years, like there's definitely been this shift in, in architecture and technology. We've gone from hardware to software at the edge. We've moved that perhaps from the more classic layer four IP imports into this layer seven, you know, HTTP metadata, Kafka metadata, MongoDB metadata. We're, we're making decisions based on richer metadata at the protocol level. And we, we are trying to go from this centralized management model to the decentralized world. It's always a trade-off with this stuff. You want some kind of centralized guardrails. Operations are often incentivized to you know, keep things running. Developers, we're incentivized to go faster, release new stuff. It's a, it's a healthy tension there, right? As folks adopt things like microservices and Kubernetes, the, the friction points I see is scaling the edge management. Suddenly you've gone from this monolith at the edge to 10 services, 20 services or whatever. As soon as folks can build microservices, they typically do build microservices. They build a lot of them in my experience of, of various projects. And not only scaling the edge management, but it's supporting multiple protocols. People get excited. They can do their own thing in each microservice. Suddenly they realize there's a better protocol for the job. Oh, I want gRPC because it's a binary protocol. Oh, I want WebSockets because it's good for streaming. And then you've got to make sure your gateway supports all these things and developers need to specify in terms of auth and rate limiting all the cross-functional concerns, how they link up to. 
And the method message really is choose your platform, and in this case, your gateway intentionally. But it, it, I, I find this hard. You know, as I move from monolith to microservices, and I went to containers and Kubernetes, there's just a lot of stuff to learn, right? And in, unless it's that's like your primary focus of your job, particularly as if you're just a small development team, this stuff can feel a bit overwhelming. So I think reading things like team topologies, understanding how the structure of the org and, and how you offer the platform to people is, is really a good thing to do. I definitely recommend the team topologies book, but just also have a think about if you're moving to say new technology like the cloud, are you bringing your old technologies with you? Are you bringing your old mindsets with you? It's not always a bad thing, but it's definitely worth contemplating. Should we change the tech? Should we change the processes? Should we change the workflow? Subtle plug, I'm working on a few tools there. If you are looking to get involved in Kubernetes and, and play around with these things, I've talked about the need for a playground to get started. So there's a free tool we've got here where you can configure if you've got a blank Kubernetes cluster locally or, or in GKE or something, and you want to bootstrap like ingress, um, networking, and things like GitOps, like continuous delivery, um, tool there you can answer a few questions about how your cluster is set up, and it will generate a bunch of YAML for you to get started and you can play around with this tech, because nothing beats playing around with this tech. It can be a bit complicated, and playing around with it reduces the barrier, I think, quite quickly. So subtle plug to stuff I'm working on there. Other than that, feel free to reach out to me. You can find me, I say, on the interwebs at Daniel Bryant UK, most places. A couple of podcasts. I, I work on the InfoQ podcast, the Architecture podcast. I've got a Culture and Methods podcast with my uh, with uh, my friend Shane Hasty on there. So if you're into the Culture and Methods stuff, we've got you covered on InfoQ on that. And you can find my writings on, on both the Ambassador and the InfoQ blogs. So uh, at that point, I'll say thanks for your time.